Well, the challenges are definitely that they are searching for kind of a future perspective for the Chinese economy that goes beyond the model that they have, if you call it a model that they have applied in the last decades. Um, they think that, uh, or we all think actually, that probably labor intensive export orientation uh, is not the way to go for the future. Wages are rising, resources are becoming scarcer, but especially it is also not prestigious enough. So the government really strives for what they call moving up the value chain, so getting away from just producing at very low profit margins for global markets, but actually moving in those sections of the, well, what we call value chain, where they can earn more money and then also pay higher wages and create other types of jobs. Uh, this is a difficult balancing act because you have to have uh, the human resources to do so, which is uh, a big challenge on the side of the education system and so on. But you also have to make sure that you that you don't move out the traditional sectors uh, too fast, so that people who have not the the, the educational level to, for doing something else uh, are actually running into unemployment. But the idea is that they want to well shift kind of the heavy industries somewhere to somewhere else, <laughs> uh, maybe partly to the eastern, uh, the western part of China, but mostly I would say actually along the Ober, uh, the One Belt One Road uh, lines, and then concentrate on actually green and smart industries. And smart is everything which comes with telecommunications, and make this into the big uh, industries uh, that carry China's economy in the well into the next decades. Well, I would not say, I, I see it, the made, made in China 2025 more as kind of a targeting of where they want to end up, uh, sort of what they what had to. And that is kind of, okay, they have cleared the goals for 2020, 25, and then actually it goes until 2049. It's mm -hmm. not stopping it uh, made in, uh, at 2025. So, and that is kind of something that we know from the past that they kind of formulate uh, the task. But the crucial issue that this is a strategy for being innovative and uh, for creating China's competitiveness based on innovation. And that is the game changer. Uh, because in the past it was kind of, okay, uh, we we look at the industrial countries and uh, industrialized countries, we know somehow where we want to head to, where we want to be competitive, where we maybe can be competitive. Uh, but the, I mean, always coming from this notion of catching up, so it, it, that was not the word probably that the Chinese used. But the idea was very much, okay, you, you somehow have the role models that you follow. And the further they go along the line of Made in China 2025 and, and all those targets of the two centenary goals for 2049, um, the less they have kind of a role model because um, they actually want to overtake uh, the industrialized countries, at least in some uh, industries. I mean, if you put so much emphasis on certain indicators that you can measure, then you get what you can measure. Mm -hmm. Because that is, if the incentives created in the system are here that you have to fulfill these targets, then people uh, tend to uh, fulfill the target. We had that problem. That is not new. I mean, we have seen that in the past. What is perhaps more uh, severe currently is that really people are a bit scared of doing something alternative. I mean, this kind of uh, doing something in your area where you think this is good, I just do it regardless of what the, what the central government tells me. Uh, I think this kind of initiative is currently sub somehow subdued because people fear that taking too much initiative may actually create criticism mm -hmm. from the top. Mm -hmm. That is one thing. The other thing is that um, overall I would say that the innovation strategy of China often is just different from what, let's say, we're used in, to in Germany. It's not like, I mean, we have this example with the windmills. That was a, I, that's a classic for me, where, where people always said, oh, they will never do the windmills because they are in, inefficient. And they put, put, uh, put up these or set up these huge wind parks, and then 50% of the windmills don't run. And, and anyway, it's not connected to the grid yet. But uh, that was, we talked about these things seven, eight years ago, and it was true. They had a lot of problems. The German approach is to, okay, you put this windmill into the laboratory, you test it for, I don't know, hours, 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 you simulate 25 years of use, and then say, oh, it's working, okay, then we can put it up. In China, it's different. You put out 1,000 windmills, you say, okay, some don't work, what's wrong? And then you check, is it take them down again? It's a completely different approach. And, and, um, and they are pretty aware that if there are 100 robot parks, probably 85 will not work in the long run, but 50, 15 emerge that are really good, that's sufficient for them currently.
they have a long-term strategy of first uh, supporting um, why are the five years plans and the science and technology plans, certain research from looking to say, okay, this industry, we cannot yet compete. We, we, we don't do that. Solar is a good example. They, they were very clear that solar energy was too expensive for China, mm -hmm. first of all, in the 2000s, and that they did not have access to the core raw material. I mean, being actually a uh, processed raw material and, and this purified silicon. They, they couldn't do it. They didn't know how to produce and there wasn't a oligopoly globally. So they said, okay, this is not an option for us. We go for wind first. We go, don't go for PV. But they catered or they, they fostered uh, scientific uh, uh, research on it. And eventually in 2008-9, they broke the monopoly because they knew how to do it. And suddenly the prices of the raw material tumbled. And that, I mean, that was a revolution for the global market, but it was also for China. And that kind of created the basis for them then later to say, okay, now we can also employ it in China. They, the government was still hesitant because it was still more expensive, but eventually they supported it. And now they are the most important, uh, I mean, in terms of new installation, in terms of investment, they are the most important investor in China, but also globally they invest a lot. And so um, from that perspective, um, the industrial policies somehow work, but it is, again, and this is the other approach. The real signal of the industrial policies is go for it and make as much as you can and then we see what comes up. Mm -hmm. And well, and the other thing is that there is a challenge for the future because renewable energies, especially solar, but also partly wind, is actually best in a used in a decentralized way. Mm -hmm. And so far they were very good in, 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 in the centralized programs, but they actually what is now growing most is decentralized renewable energy. And that I think, and that is actually our future research more than the past, is, is really a challenge because that creates challenges for the grid, for the management of the grid, for, for, for the local power play and so on. So I, I'm, I'm very curious how that will work out.